Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this roundtable discussion with Atlee Homa and Emerald Rippard Denniston, two of the artists included in A Mark Here Again, a digital exhibition curated by Melina Mayer and presented by Real Asian Film Festival as part of Ra 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 Special Projects. My name is Gessa Nanglu, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. So for those who have not had a chance to check out the exhibition, it's currently being hosted online on rarara.ca. Featuring a mix of archival works and new commissions, the show highlights pan-Asian Canadian artists whose works experiment with personal histories and broader shared knowledge to support social change and community needs through an activist lens. It looks at diasporic and multi-generational neighborhoods like Toronto's Chinatown to uh, consider the resiliency, hope, and futurities that site-specific spaces hold. So before we get into introductions, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Ra 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 is affiliated with Real Asian, whose offices are located on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat Nations. This territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Covenant, a treaty of collective responsibility for the protection and sharing of land and resources. As a digitally hosted space, we encourage audiences to learn the specific histories and stories of the lands they're settled on. The 11 treaty lands, many treaty agreements and traditional unceded territories that continue to demand justice and to support the ongoing work of indigenous leaders and communities. We acknowledge the abundance of positionalities, histories, communities, and relationships in Asian and Asian diasporic film and media arts. Regardless of our pathways, we all benefit from the Canadian government's history of broken treaties and reckon openly with our responsibility as settler immigrants to this land and its original stewards, naming the ways we are complicit in structures of white supremacy. We honor the longstanding work of organizers, creatives, and communities that continue to give us hope, language, and possibility. We stand with Indigenous peoples all over Turtle Island who are exercising their sovereignty and working towards justice and freedoms, whose histories, presence, and imagined futures inspire us over and over to envision what our future worlds must look like. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our artist today. And first I'd like to welcome Atli Homa, who is a good friend of mine who I've known since my time at OCAD. We've been friends for, I think about a decade now. Um, Atli is an artist working in Toronto or Toronto. In her artist practice, she implements painting to express her experiences as a half Japanese woman. Focusing on cultural identity, care, and well being, she looks to find connection to her ancestors using inherited heirlooms, knickknacks, and domestic objects as subjects for her works, creating scenes that call upon memory and familial history. So, welcome, Atli. And also uh, Emerald, um, who I've had the pleasure of getting to know and whose work I've become familiar with. Um, through this panel and through preparing this talk. Um, Emerald is a queer Chinese Canadian visual artist. She's committed to anti-colonial and anti-capitalist politics and activist work, and wishes to break apart from settler colonial heteropatriarchal binaries and beliefs. Based in Squamish, Sleibletooth, and Musqueam, or Vancouver, and Takaranto or Toronto, her practice focuses on the diaspora Canadian experience through drawing, painting, and digital media. She's an emerging artist acquiring a Bachelor of Fine Arts in the Drawing and Painting program from Oakland University with a minor in Art and Social Change. So welcome Emeralds, welcome both of you. Uh, for this talk, um, we're just gonna start with a bit of an introduction to each of your works, um, some questions about the works to do a bit of a deeper dive and uh, get some more insight into your process and thinking. And then we'll get together for a bit of a, a group discussion discussion towards the ends to talk about the show more broadly and also like the shared the shared themes between uh, your two works. So to start, uh, Atli, I'd love it if you could share a bit about your work with all of us by reading your statement from the show. Yes, so um, in pink and yellow still life we cherish items, I constructed a still life using a selection of items accumulated over my lifetime. Items like the central silk bag and handmade golden wallet to the right of the bag were given to me by my paternal relatives on trips to visit them in Vancouver when I was little or sent to me in care packages. The coral cloth atop the wallet was scrap left over from a quilt I recently made for one of my great aunties. 
when trying to understand myself as a Japanese East Asian mixed race woman. I often think of my grandma and my aunties. I think about their experiences in Canada and the things that they did that I have always admired with wonder, like quilting, making clothes, crocheting, and baking. They always did these things for me and tried to teach me how to do them as, as well. And that sharing of knowledge always felt like an ultimate expression of love. I take pride in doing these same things that they did to better understand who they were and make them proud while simultaneously feeling closer to them and to who I am. In this still life, as well as many of my other still lifes, I make reference to Japanism, painting of the mid to late 19th century in an effort to reinsert myself into the history in a way that gives myself agency, while also being able to properly respect these treasured items of my family. In this particular painting, I also took inspiration from Edo period landscapes of mountainous terrain and bodies of water. The cherry blossom chocolate is one of my, uh, my mother's favorite treats and is famously and is a famously Canadian confectionery. Cherry blossoms or sakura is a beloved pink flower in Japan, which beautifully blooms on the trees in the spring annually. annually. When seeing the chocolate box, I cannot help but think about my experience, my existence as a mixed race woman. Thank you. So uh, I wanted to start off by just talking about something that's very, I guess it's sort of like the first thing that I notice about, about this painting and many of your works is the fact that it's, it's a still life. And um, I just wanted to talk about, I guess, the still life genre, which, you know, for me and for a lot of people harkens back to something very historical and like a very specific period of time um, and like a whole, a whole, um, not only a period of time, but also the movements and the specific artists who, who worked in that, in that, um, in that style and that format. Um, but also, you know, how your, your painting kind of, it feels like you're reinterpreting that genre at the same time, and it feels, um, very contemporary. So uh, tell us a bit about your process for creating still lifes. How do you select your objects and compose them? And what drew you to the still life format? Well, um, I've always liked looking at still life painting. I feel like when I see still lifes, I'm very interested in the items and very interested in looking at them. Um, for my last body of work, I made that body of work during like, the first half of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, <laughs> I couldn't see people and I <laughs> didn't have a lot of models. And uh, I was kind of like, that didn't seem like an option for me when I started making my last body of work. So, and also I was living at my family home that I grew up in. And so I was kind of like looking through all of these things that I hadn't seen for so long, all of these um, uh, mementos and gifts and like things that I knew I had, but that I didn't think about until I found it. Like I was going through like old suitcases and old boxes and finding all these things. And I was like, oh my gosh, I love these um, items. I'm so glad it's still here. I'm so glad I kept mm -hmm. it. Um, so for this painting, uh, I had, found um, the silk bag and the gold wallet that's underneath the pink fabric to the right. And I'm pretty sure the silk bag was sent to me. I don't know who gave it to me, but I know that one of my family members sent it to me. And the gold wallet, um, one of my aunties gave to me at like a family gathering in Vancouver. And I wanted to um, choose them because they're these little gifts, these little things that they gave me that I felt compelled to keep for yeah. my whole life and that I would never part with. Mm -hmm. And they're not necessarily items that I use in my day-to-day -day life or things that like, yeah, they're not necessarily those kinds of items, but I'm gonna keep them forever. And so I wanted to just like um, give them a special moment in that mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of like the the thing about still lifes is that as soon as you commit something to paint, you're sort of like inherently attributing it with value. And yeah. even if you're depicting like everyday objects or things that don't necessarily have 
uh, an obvious value, uh, you know, they're not expensive or the things that people are familiar with, things that people have seen before or can buy in a normal shop uh, mm -hmm. just, just by virtue of, of composing them in a still life and, and creating a painting, you know, as a viewer, you see it and you immediately think like, what, what is the significance of this object? Why did, why did Atlee choose a chocolate box and why did she need yeah. to make something of it? And I also love that, that that box is a part of the painting because I think, um, you know, the silk bag and the, and the materials and the wallet to the right, I think those kind of, um, they could be part of a more traditional historical still life, but then the inclusion of the chocolates feels like it brings it into like a contemporary um, context. And even like the, the outlet to the left side, it, it feels very much like um, sort of like a disruption to what we understand to be like a traditional still life. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what I was going for when I chose <laughs> to do those two things. Like, I wanted the outlet because I wanted it to be clear, like, where, like, what time and where. And the chocolate box, like, I loved the synthetic yellow, mm -hmm. like, that like, synthetic yellow. And, like, what the reason I ended up choosing the chocolate box was because my brother had actually bought it for my mom and he showed up at the house and he sometimes brings treats or little things and he said mom I bought this for you because I remember when I was little do you still love them mm -hmm. and she was like I do love them and and she ate I said can I have the box like <laughs> need I it for painting <laughs> yeah she had to decide for me so that I could put it in the painting and I I really absolutely it's 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 great that you noticed that those two elements were purposefully to like bring it out of the uh, more traditional for sure. um, yeah for sure and even even like the cropping and just the composition generally like it feels it feels very like in the moment now and you know like the the kind of awareness of of like a camera and yes. the composition that we we create with cameras today even even you know like I kind of hate to say it because it's a bit of a trope but like the the format being like uh, square. Square, square format obviously yes. so like an Instagram social yeah. media way of looking but at that's things, how but... my my mind thinks about cropping things honestly mm -hmm. like I feel like I often go towards the square very naturally so it's it's something I, I feel the same as you where it's like oh I don't want to point to it but it's like you can't not <laughs> so I totally yeah it's just it's just the dimension of our age of like the millennial <laughs> age <laughs> yeah maybe absolutely. Maybe the Gen Zers will be that, like, I don't know what the dimensions is, like four, four by 16 or whatever. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. TikTok for, for TikTok, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thank you. Um, I'm just going to move on to the next question, which is about um, Japanism, which is something that you mentioned. And, you know, we went to OCAD together and we were in art history class together in first year. And I remember when we talked about Orientalism, Shinwazari, Japanism, and uh, you know, obviously looking at it now, we can apply a critical lens, but I guess I was just wondering if you could speak more to your relationship with the visual material of that era, like positive, negative, do you feel good or bad about it? You know, as a Japanese woman specifically, you have, you know, a different, a different um, perspective looking at, at the works from that time and, you know, as a contemporary artist as well. Um, and yeah, for context, like you, you mentioned it a, a bit in your in your statement, but we're talking about this period in the 1800s when, when um, trade in Japan was like forcibly opened, and there was like this huge influx of uh, decorative arts and materials coming from Japan to uh, and like being introduced to a European market for the first time, and just such a such a huge response from from Europeans generally, but also artists of that time. Um, so yeah, like when you look at artworks from that period, does it feel harmful? Does it feel just naive? Um, how do you interpret them now? And how does your work kind of like fit into that? Sorry, that was a lot of questions. <laughs> no, no, excellent. Uh, it, does, it feels both, it feels harmful, it feels naive. Um, I remember like in art history class, like hearing um, about Orientalism, like there was a whole first year class just about Orientalism. And I remember just being like, oh my gosh, like it really was the, it resonated so much with me. And I was like, 
really like listening like in our history class like I was always listening and like learning but that class was very like oh okay like I felt seen I felt like I understood it was saying things that putting words to feelings mm -hmm. um, uh, I know that when I did a painting um, there's a painting I I made that has a paint so when I was born my uncle Abe painted this little painting of a little girl, little uh, who was supposed to be me, and wrote a message in text and kanji on it. And uh, I wanted to add that to one of my other still lives. So I painted that painting. And I remember telling my dad, like, I'm going to do this. And he said, you have to make sure that you get the text um, right, that you actually write the same thing. Because in a lot of um, you know, these paintings were talking about Japanese and paintings, they don't do that. They just kind of scribble it. They're not too concerned about the accuracy. Um, and my dad said, like, I don't like that when I see that. And, you know, I think that shows like that it, it can be hurtful. You know, right. you want it to be right because those words mean something. You know, okay. my uncle Abe wrote those words for me, you know? And I, it said, uh, congratulations, congratulations on the arrival of your cute baby. That's what it said. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it's so important and special. And even like the painting that he did, the little girl that he painted, I even wanted to get that right. Like exactly how he painted it because mm -hmm. he did it with so much care and thoughtfulness. And uh, yeah, that that's just something I think about all the time in relation to uh, it's how I relate to it, I think. Well, it's, it's totally such a huge, uh, there's such a difference in your approach to, to those kinds of objects and, and representing them because, you know, that's, that's where the kind of naivete um, plays into it. You know, you think about, I, you know, I don't think it's necessarily um, malicious, the, the work that was being produced during that time, but, you know, there's, there's also something to say about ignorance and the way that, um, some of those objects or that like cultural material and that imagery was reproduced without any care. And you yeah. know, you and and I think that, have a lot of responsibility to it. I think so much about what I'm gonna put in my paintings, I really do. And it'll be like, maybe I have the idea, like maybe I'll put this thing in the painting and I'll think about it for months and try to make sure, I do. And I think no. I try to think about it for months <laughs> to, to make sure that I do it in a way that I can stand behind and mm -hmm. that I will, that that properly respects those items. Like I did a painting with a Japanese doll that my grandparents gave me for like my sixth birthday and they like, they had it brought in from Japan. They had a case made for it. And it's just like, you know, this special thing, like how how do I make sure that this item, this, this thing is appreciated to the level that it needs to be? And it's like, at a certain point, like you don't always have all the control that you want, but you can try, you can. And I think that's the thing is that like these items are not, um, they're so special to me in, in a way that like they were given to me, they were, they're heirlooms. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. And sort of like connected to that, um, I wanted to ask, you mentioned in your, your statement how um, through painting these objects, you and through painting the objects and also through kind of taking up some of these craft practices like sewing and crochet and baking and etc you're able to feel a connection to your family and your ancestry so I was wondering like what it meant to be able to make that connection and to pay homage to your family through through your painting and also through these these other craft practices yeah it's it's really like I I feel really happy to do that. I'm like, you know, uh, my grandmother, she passed away um, right before this uh, show opened. And uh, she did so many amazing things, one of them being quilting. And she had made this quilt a long time ago. And it's like one of our, my family's favorite quilts. We always used it like on the sofa. And it, it was like such a, loved quote we still have it and um 
my brother who him and his partner are now having a child uh they uh i wanted to make a quilt for the child mm -hmm. and i said like what kind of quilt would you like and my brother was like i want it to be just like this one that grandma made yeah. and so i remade that quilt in different colors but it's the same quilt and it's smaller because it's for a baby <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I was able to show my grandma the quilt before she passed and say like I made this quilt to be exactly like the one you made because we loved it so much yeah. and like and then I actually have painted that quilt in a new painting mm -hmm. since and like all that it's I think it really is how I I feel close to my family. It's how I try to respect my family. It's how I try to love and process these things. And so, yeah, I don't know if I answered the question. No, but no, it's, totally. It's I just think... to say that like, yeah, it's all important. It's all connected. And I feel, it feels right. And it feel, I feel lucky that I get to do that. Totally. And, you know, one of the, one of the concepts that was sort of part of the curatorial brief was, something about, uh, you know, care and uh, placemaking and, and, you know, making connections to your communities. And I guess I, I see that with your work um, and how you, you access your family and your ancestry through, through objects. And, you know, some of that, I think, I think anyone can sort of relate to that, um, having missing pieces in, in your family or, certain parts of your family history that may be obscure that need to be uncovered. And, you know, even just like having conversations with family members, no matter how close they are, that um, for whatever reason, haven't come up for however many years and through, through art making practices and through like honoring the objects that you do in, in your paintings, you're able to do that, which is like, a, it's a beautiful thing. And it extends beyond painting and into you know, those other practices that you're taking up, which are carried on from generation to generation and, you know, are even being car carried on to your, like, niece or nephew who's, like, soon to be born, which is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, thank you. We'll, <laughs> we'll move on to Emerald. Um, and if you don't mind, Emerald, before we screen your video, um, maybe you could do the same as Atlee and, and share your, your artist statement for the show. Okay, cool. Um, so, my art, good job, Atlee, by the way. <laughs> Amazing work. <laughs> um, so, in con my, the title's called Conflict with the Internal Occident and the External Orient, Story of Isolation. Um, I explore the idea of isolation during the pandemic, specifically my own personal narrative and what, what it feels like to be a visible minority. The ways in which my body has navigated through life has been uncomfortable. Toronto's Chinatown feels foreign. China, my country of birth, has a, great, has a great disconnect and is only visualized through photos and stories that my parents took when coming to adopt me. And North Vancouver has brought me up to assimilate socially and culturally to whiteness. It has left me with both an identity crisis and um, internalized racism. I struggle a lot mentally with trying to understand my intersections and feel as though my body is interpreted in many ways. During the recent rise of hate crimes, which was in 2020, I guess, or 2021. Uh, oh my gosh, so yeah, last year. Um, <laughs> and continue. Uh, um, yeah. Um, I roam the streets publicly afraid as I get stereotyped while simultaneously stereotyping myself. My whitewashed mind struggles to validate Asian experiences during this time and my community's lack of understanding. This cut out motion animation narrates these topics to show fragmentation interrupting, interrogating, and reframing different ways of thinking and seeing. Um, and this obviously was made during that time. So it feels like a little weird blast to the past. So keep that like a time mind, I guess, while watching it. Yeah, yeah. I will now uh, screen the video. It's about three and a half minutes long and it's also available on the rarara.ca website and YouTube channel. So I'll play that now. Thank 
So my first question is again about format, which I think sort of tends to be the first thing that I, I notice with the work and I'm curious about and definitely want to ask an artist if, if I have the opportunity to talk to them. So um, and for you in particular with your with your practice spanning across both um, video and painting, I was really curious about how you came to the, the decision to create this work, which in a sense combines both through drawing, collage, um, the cutouts, the illustrations, and the motion animation. So how do you, um, what, what brought you to that decision? And also how do you feel those formats maybe differ for you within your practice? Is your painting practice and your video practice separate? Are they, um, do they intersect and overlap? Yeah, so for this one, um... I guess, yeah, I, so again, I was in third year while I was doing this and um, it was for an art and social change course that I had. And during it is when we were online learning and I was in my little apartment and I wasn't painting that much because I was boxed in. <laughs> um, and yeah, I guess I wanted to try something new besides painting 
um, that semester. Um, I really want to try this new, like, I, I always think cut motion animation specifically is such a cool thing and like claymation as well. And I was like, you know, I've seen people do it. I want to, I want to challenge myself and see if I can actually pull this thing off. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously that wasn't, uh, that didn't come before the actual concept itself. So in March, I believe that's when the um, hate crimes in Atlanta happened. And so our class had a big discussion on it and it hit me really hard. And I was sitting in this apartment during the pandemic and I was kind of spiraling at that moment. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I think this is the time to like uh, do something else besides painting. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's, what, that, that's where the cut uh, motion animation came from. Mm -hmm. um, I was gonna say, uh, I've definitely been, like the process of painting better <laughs> because this took actually a lot of time, um, yeah. but I'm glad I did it. It felt like very rewarding. And I think I also wanted to tell this like narrative story um, that I couldn't may maybe through a still life composition. Um, I really wanted to like, yeah, go through three different scenes mm -hmm. and yeah, uh, and uh, tell a, I was trying to find the word for it, but like a narrative story for this yeah. piece, and how I felt. The thing that, that struck me for sure is that, uh, like it does, it does still feel to me very related to your painting pra practice, just because I see sort of like overlapping, um, like imagery and, and like the inclusion of the drawings as well. Um, but I, I think it's like the perfect format for what you're talking about, having these like have having it be like a, a narrative like a full story that has like almost acts um yeah I think I think it worked so perfectly for that and it's such a short like it's a, it's not a long video but it really it it tells like a full story and it's so kind of like compact and effective um yeah no I I love the video format I think it's great and I it's it's funny hearing you say that um that you found it difficult and that it was like labor intensive because um, I think that's that's so true of like a lot of like media arts and you know not not in my own practice not speaking from experience but I think like as as artists who are um, like more familiar or trained in in drawing and painting it's you you kind of develop um, a familiarity with drawing and painting where you can do it quite quickly. You know, not to say that it doesn't take effort, but you get into the groove of it and then taking on any different kind of medium, you realize like how much, how much kind of like labor and time it takes. And of course, for you in particular, using like cut stop motion animation is, you know, so, so much work to, to produce like a, a relatively short video, but it feels, it feels very full in my opinion. Um, so another question. Ooh. Thank you. Sorry, you <laughs> no worries. were cutting out at the first part. So sorry if I wasn't responding to that. No, no, not at all. I know it's it's tricky. Like we're we're dealing with different time zones here because you're all the way in, in Europe right now. But um, so I'll move on to my next question, which is another aspect that I, I noticed in your work in, in this work for the show and also just in your practice generally, you you use your your own image and your body a lot. Uh, and, and performance seems to play a role in your practice. So I wanted to just kind of like ask about that. Um, why, why do you gravitate to using your body and your image? Why is it integral to, to this work specifically? And, and what role does performance play in your practice more generally? Yeah, so uh, I guess the reason I use my own body or reference my own body in um, a lot of the paintings and as this video as well um, is, I guess, just inevitably to tell my own story mm -hmm. um, and represent my own identity and narrative. Um, I guess no one else knows your story but you. Um, and I try to make sense of the world by recreating the body I've lived in and my point of view. So I'd say that is it. And um, it's cool because your body is also a small part of a greater whole to have this discourse around. And I think my body is political and it represents 
not only my own experiences, but many others that are part of the Chinese Canadian diaspora, adoptee diaspora specifically, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I guess uh, the performance piece, I, I'm i very drawn to um, exa over-exaggerated figures and facial expressions and humor. Mm -hmm. um, I was in like theater when I was growing up. And I really enjoyed that acting, yeah, as well. So I guess I like my body to be put on to stage and to be put on for show, mm -hmm. uh, not in like a weird idealized version of it, but like kind of a, I like to kind of poke fun and mockery, like use mockery of my body as well in a weird way. I feel like as someone growing up in an Asian, body it I felt very discomforted by my body and not idealized and mm -hmm. I think it's almost caricature like how I maneuver sometimes so mm -hmm. I wanted to really um yeah I guess uh exaggerate that in this this work here great yeah that's that kind of leads me into my last question which is about humor and and yeah like that that really um jumps out the way that your like your body and your expressions are like so exaggerated in this work and to like a humorous effect but obviously the the subject matter that we're talking about like racial and cultural identity and you know microaggressions and um racism and anti-asian hate crimes like these are extremely dark and difficult conversations but you approach it with with playfulness and with humor and I wanted to ask you about that and um, you know, kind of related like about your choice to engage with like pejoratives and stereotypes, which I think is like like a really a really tricky thing to do. It's like things that we growing up would maybe um, bury down deep and and ignore or avoid. But in in this work, like for example, um, in one of the screenshots on the screen, you can kind of see these like East Asian caricatures, these like racist stereotype drawings, like the famous like yellow peril image. And I think like at, at one point in the video, you're eating a banana, which obviously like is a common phrase, like a derogatory phrase towards Asians who are like too westernized, like they're yellow on the outside, white on the inside. So so why do you why do you engage with those and and what is playfulness and humor? Um, what part does it play in your practice? Yeah, um, I think uh, it's funny, like growing up to like just as a human, I think as a kid, like I was crazy at growing up and like my parents were like, Emerald, like we could control you. And like some of my friends growing up too would be like, you were a lot like as a kid. Um, and I think <laughs> that just like comes from just being like, I guess, funny or goofy at the core of who I am. Mm -hmm. But also like, um, I guess that like, you're growing up in your adolescent years and like you start hearing humor that becomes more harsh or like derogatory and like swear words and racial slurs become funny to, mm -hmm. to teens. And I think with my practice, I, I reflect a lot on like my past um, self and like my past environment. And I think I'm in this weird like transitional stage of adulthood where it's just constant, like looking back on the past and seeing who you were and I think um yeah I wanted to fit in like everyone does growing up and I think I made those you know self-deprecating jokes to myself these like racialized stereotypical jokes and you know a lot of my white friends would make them at me as well because I was okay with it and I'd let them and I'd allow that to happen and I think um, that like, yeah, like you said, people um, hide that and kind of bury it under and don't want to like surface. It. But like, I think I've come to this place where it's like, no, I'm like gonna bring this out and I need to put it on its back almost um, of how this is like deeply ingrainedly affected me, I guess. Um, and I was gonna say, um, I, I think I like to play with symbols like the banana and um, like 
digging my way to China, like taking photos. I think it's because it's been so, yeah, again, shoved down my throat growing up. Um, like I would do it. And then my, I remember like my dad would always say, uh, like, oh, Emerald, you got to dig your way to China. Or like when I like picking is like picking the nose or something would be like, oh, you're digging your way to China. Uh, or like, yeah, the banana slur, I guess. And I never thought that was a bad thing. I almost like even prided myself with being a banana. Um, and I think, yeah, I think a lot of other um, Asian Canadians can um, can relate to that, these symbols. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can definitely relate uh, yeah it, it just becomes I know. like you said it becomes like so pervasive and like as soon as you start to participate in it yourself like you start to convince yourself that it's like totally benign and obviously like if if you're growing up with it at, at a young age then it's hard to kind of like parse through that and um you know build an awareness of of like the harm of things that are seemingly harmless mm -hmm. yeah. um so well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's like a I think it's a really brave thing, and I think it's uh, like I said, like I we come from different pathways, we come from different backgrounds and experiences, but like I think uh, it's like something that people, Pan Asian people and people across cultures and ethnicities can kind of relate to is um, you know those internalized feelings growing up and and building an awareness and and all of that. So. You know, I think it's I think it's a great thing to have a conversation about and make work around. Thank you. Um, yes. So I think now we can now that we've like learned a bit more about each other's works, um, it would be really great to have a group discussion about the exhibition broadly and also just the the shared themes that that you both kind of exhibit in your work, which which I think there are of which I think there are many. Um, so I'm just gonna bring you back in, Atlee, because I think I turned off your video. <laughs> I think I'm, I think I'm back now. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Hi. That was great, Emerald and Jessa. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, uh, one, one of the shared things I noticed was the way that you both responded to the exhibition from like a very personal place. Like, uh, you know, some of the themes in the curatorial statement are pretty broad, speaking a lot to like a, a whole community of people and to community activism, to placemaking, to mutual care. But I think both of you and also, you know, all of the artists in the exhibition actually responded from a place that is very personal, um, telling your own individual stories, talking about family and, and your upbringing. So um, I wanted to ask, like, how do you think these personal narratives can also speak to broader um, Pan-Asian communities and experiences, which uh, Emerald and I were just sort of talking about already, but um, would love to hear both your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, even listening to your conversation, like, I was thinking about, um, you know, my experiences. And I think, like, like, like I was saying before, like in the class where we were um, learning about Orientalism, it's like that it catches your attention. There's a light bulb moment because you feel like a connection. You feel like, oh, I know what this is. I can, I, I know exactly what this is. And so like with Emerald's work, um, it's like I immediately am like, I know what this is. I hear this and I, relating to this and these are important things that we that connect us and that make us feel seen and yeah it just gives us like it just connects us like I can't see it in any other way mm -hmm. uh, yeah mm -hmm. yeah I agree um I think sharing your own personal narratives lets others um in and it can allow them to empathize and relate and to also see uh, similar representations of one's, yeah, of your own life. Um, yeah, I think, I, I, I don't think, well, for me personally, I'm, I'm not speaking on behalf of, a, but I feel like I'm not anything special, really. I just think we're like a little speck of the greater whole and like totally. just trying to share how 
I feel and others feel as well. Sorry, <laughs> motorcycle. That connects us. <laughs> um, yeah, and to understand like the complex layers of like an individual and the uh, intersections and things and everything that encapsulates the lived experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Like it's, it's, um, it goes both ways. Um, like Emerald, I was just thinking, like kind of popped into my mind. Um, I was like familiarizing myself with some of your other work outside of the show. And like, you had a video work. Um, it was sort of like a documentary style, like interviews with other like Chinese adoptees from oh, yeah. Vancouver. And like, you know, that's, that, it's just something that popped into my mind thinking about like the conversation we're having now because it's like in in one sense like we all have very individual experiences that only we can speak to but in another sense it's like you can kind of take yourself out of that and see how many other people have this shared experience like even if it's you know only only facets of it but in a way we all we all share so many of these same experiences and it's it's also connected to to the ways in which we have to just live and breathe within a society that oppresses people of of all different of all different backgrounds and upbringings and and no matter what you come from it's it's so far reaching that a lot of people end up with with unfortunately like the same experience but um yeah uh i'll just move on to our last question question actually we're, we're almost coming up to an hour which is shocking i feel like this has been like 20 minutes of talking <laughs> and an hour really went by so fast i know it's just like totally just zoomed by but i mean it's amazing that we had such a such an organic conversation and that it felt like just just chatting the three of us but um the last thing i wanted to ask it's it's a bit of a sensitive question so you're free to answer it however deeply you wish to but Something that kind of came to my mind when I was learning about your works is, um, and, and some of the shared themes about um, like perceived racial identity and being othered in like public spaces versus your own cultural upbringing, which may be like, you know, in opposition or, or conflicts with, with your racial or ethnic background. Um, how has that maybe impacted your artistic practice and your artistic journey? Has it made you more reluctant to make autobiographical work or you know the complete opposite has it made you more en enthusiastic about speaking on that experience or more more motivated to to speak to that experience <laughs> i i i, uh, I i know for me like i've my whole life like um from the outside you know it's always like Oh, Atli is half Asian. Atli's a uh, mixed race, and like, I feel like I have been thinking about that forever. And the choice to start like speaking about that in my work, I wanted to do it in a way that felt good for me and mm -hmm. felt safe for me. And so it took me time to figure out exactly how to do that on my terms and that, yeah, that I could stand behind. So it's something that I, and you're right, like it is something that like kind of, for, it can be difficult to talk about, but it, it just naturally, it was like, I have to talk, this is my life, this is who I am. I can only, I think like, yeah, I can only say what I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think I agree. Like, I think what you were saying is that you get th these terms thrown at you and these titles and boxes thrown at you your whole life. And then, you know, you don't want to take up space and you don't want to, you know, you're not really proud to be othered in a way. And so I think as artists, you know, this is our time, like we are taking up space and we are representing the things that like mean, what, what mean, sorry, what uh, we're passionate about and what drives us to, you know, keep, keep uh, telling these stories. And I think, yeah, uh, I think I'm really, I, I, I don't want to say autobiographical, autobiographical, is that it? 
the mm-hmm. word. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, I, I feel like so self-centered when it's just like, oh, I'm making art about me. But I need to also then like s- step back and be like, okay, no, you're valid and you're making work because this is, you know, you're changing things. And, and um, yeah, I guess this is a way of like reflecting and helping me as an individual grow but other people people grow as well and yeah that's I, so I, guess, you know, I, I, I feel I totally so I feel that. that yeah I totally agree with that I think like it's something that a lot of artists struggle with is you know wanting to avoid making identity-based art or autobiographical art wanting to make something outside of yourself but then ultimately feeling like you know at some point how do you avoid having a part of yourself in the work yeah and you know the things that are the most significant to you inevitably have to do with you and your perspective Mm -hmm. um and yeah like we were talking about when you grow up in a in a culture of assimilation and uh you know assimilation for self-preservation and safety you feel like an avoidance you know i'm speaking generally like this this may not be the case for everyone but certainly in my case, like wanting to avoid sticking out and, and being othered. But uh, and I think like I was saying about your work, Emerald, and like this goes for you too, Ali, like I think you're both very brave for, for kind of meeting these difficult topics head on. And I know it's also like extremely emotionally draining for artists. <laughs> and uh, I, do, I do think like ultimately they open up these conversations for, for other people, like whether or not we have the the shame the the shared experience or the same experience. I think, I mean, even like, what are we doing right now? But but having a conversation about about these things and like the three of us coming from completely different upbringings find so much so much overlap and connection. So yeah, I think that's a good place to end it. <laughs> um, so I'll just uh, before we leave close out with a few a few thoughts and thanks. So first of all. I'd like to thank both of you, Atlee and Emerald, for joining me today for this conversation and for sharing more insight into your works and your practice. Um, I'd also like to thank the Toronto Real Asian Film Festival for creating this amazing exhibition, um, which, you know, by extension supports this program. And, you know, particular thanks to Melina, who was the one who kind of brought us all together here to have this conversation and, and was the curator of the exhibition. And then like, lastly, I would like to thank anyone who's watching this recording. Um, thank you for taking the time to, to learn more about, about these amazing works and for being a part of this conversation. Okay, thanks. <laughs>